Hi, I'm Pat Kahn, and this is my video blog. So, over the last week, I... It's, it's been a fairly tiring week, at least as of, uh, rec uh, as of t uh, today and yesterday. Um, let's see, well, last week didn't really do anything on, on the uh, weekend. Um, as far as I can remember, I was just chilling and checking out coffee shops. Uh, doing a little bit of, uh, of coding, working on my uh, educational uh, materials. Um, on Monday I had a pretty terrible migraine uh, and didn't really do a whole lot. Uh, on Wednesday uh, I went to a, a pterosaur exhibit, uh, the members preview of the pterosaur exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History. That was fantastic. Um, so, as, as I might have mentioned, I am a big fan of what the American Museum of Natural History does. Um, I have a rather nice uh, level of membership there. I, I go to a lot of um, members' events and general events. And the uh, Pterosaur exhibit, it's a one of their temporary exhibits. Um, it'll probably be going for a few months. And it's all about pterosaurs. And I didn't actually know all that much about pterosaurs before the uh, before the event. Let's get my key ready here. It's one of the problems with uh, with last week is that I learned that I often make tea and I don't drink it. Get out of there. Uh, I don't drink it until it's already cooled down enough to no longer be interesting as a beverage. Okay, there we go. Um, but yeah, it turns out I, I didn't know as much about pterosaurs as I thought I did. And they vary incredibly in size. Some of them are about the shape of your hand. Some of them are the size of a small plane, or were. And uh, although we don't have, uh, they're fossilized remains, we only have a very small subset of what we believe uh, was a fairly widespread species. Um, their, their bones were thin. They didn't leave a lot of material um, to be fossilized. but. I mean, there's more than enough to establish uh, their features and capture some of the variability, but it's mostly coastal stuff. But the exhibit was, was really well put together. One of the things that I thought was particularly successful was they focused on how they moved. And I think in science education, uh, this is one of the things that uh, museums and other educational institutions are going to get better at, really trying to capture the imagination of people with scientific discoveries, because it's one thing to read about uh, materials in a book, or to see uh, a, uh, a still fossil, something like that. And, and that's great. It's important that, they still, uh, that museums and universities still provide that kind of experience, but helping us actually imagine uh, what it would be like to be somewhere on another planet. It would be great to have like an Oculus Rift and uh, and let's say a museum said, hey, take a look at this virtual environment we put together uh, captured by uh, MSL Curiosity or some success, uh, successor to that. That would be pretty amazing. It would really help us feel uh, like like we're, we're experiencing um, these things with, with uh, it would feel like we're really benefiting from the probes that we're sending all over the solar system. And we obviously should be sending a lot more. There's a lot of science that we're not doing just because we're pre uh, preoccupied with other things. Or, yeah, we've decided to devote those resources to uh, comfortable lives for rich people or something like that. Uh, I. There, there's a lot more science in general that we should be doing, not just ast uh, astrophysics or um, exploration, but it would be nice to, certainly would be nice to see a lot more there. Uh, but yeah, getting, having better science communication means being more interactive. And they did a really good job at that with this exhibit. Um, they, they had lots of animations of pterosaurs flying about. They had um, a, a limited amount of, of VR simulation, like screens with uh, motion capture sensors, uh, 
that would react to people moving in front of them. So you were invited to step into an area and move your arms up and down, tilt, uh, adjust your, your flat rate, and the, the big screen that you were looking at, and anybody else was probably looking at, at it too, would show your success at managing to like go into a dive to catch a fish or to regulate your flight. And that was really cool. And you saw some kids there who were having a ball at the time. Um, yeah, it was a well done exhibit. And I, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it again when it's a little bit less crowded, because it, it was crowded. Uh, AMNH. It has a lot of members, and a lot. It has a large community that's very interested in seeing uh, almost everything that they have to show us, and uh, that means that a lot of these member previews they tend to be kind of packed. So fortunately, this was paired with reception in the Hall of Mammon. So I I spent a lot of time uh, uh, downstairs just enjoying eating the mixed nuts, uh, having lots of ginger ale and a little bit of wine. And waiting until uh, until it was uh, until it was comfortable enough to go in there, and even there it was kind of packed. But I'll be going back uh, probably in a few days. I'll, I'll swing by and see uh, and and really take at, uh, a look at the exhibit uh, with more detail. But I liked what I saw. Um, I liked that they had a, uh, that they had a, a number of other uh, um, interviews and. Just pictures of what they thought these things were like, because they're not birds. They, they flew. Um, they were uh, able, or at least it's believed that they were able to regulate their body temperature, unlike other lizards. Um, they had a lot of independent adaptation to flight, and I believe this was long before birds were flying. Um, so, yeah, really, really neat stuff. Um, and then yesterday and today, uh, I spent most of the day at a Postgres user conference. Postgres is a relational database. Uh, it's actually my pref uh, it's the relational database that I prefer to use uh, when I'm when I'm given a choice. And largely, it has a really nice, very standards compliant SQL syntax, unlike MySQL, which is really a fairly lousy database. Uh, it's open source. It's uh, Easy to install and manage, has great user tools, has very has a wide variety of data types, and many of them are quite flexible. Um, it has a geodata type and a number of geodata functions called PostGIS that are probably the most useful way to do um, geographic or geometric calculation. Uh, a lot of this stuff was. Uh, it's been in post, uh, Postgres for a while. Some of it was just stuck in there uh, in very early form because somebody uh, thought it would be neat to experiment with, um, with, with additional data types that are outside the, um, the SQL standard um, because it, 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 it does pretty faithfully implement the SQL standard about as much as any other decent database, but has a whole lot of extra stuff, extra languages built in, extra types, uh, lots of plugins, lots of different, um, you have a fair number of, of different options when it comes to storage engines. Um, yeah, uh, good support for triggers, stored procedures, yada yada. Um, uh, and in, in recent versions, it's, it's also added, um, added nice clustering, uh, <clears throat> follow, uh, failover features, uh, stuff like that. So it was a good conference. Um, I'm not a particularly outgoing person, uh, but I met a lot of people, some of which might end up being job leads if the if the current job lead that I'm most interested in doesn't uh, doesn't materialize. Um, basically, somebody's making a, a recommendation for me at a company that I would really love to work for. Uh, but it's it's one of a few companies that's uh, that doesn't have a particularly high uh, hiring rate, and they also are a little bit slow to hire. So I'm hopeful. I, I'm trying to, uh, trying not to get my hopes uh, too high up, uh, particularly given how uh, how Palantir and how um, 
how Stack Exchange, how Nitro does really ended up working out for what I thought were pretty silly uh, reasons. But oh well, can't have everything. Um, I'm hopeful with this one, but but I, I met a lot of people, uh, and it's nice to have more options in case this particular opportunity doesn't uh, doesn't materialize. Um, unfortunately, both yesterday and today, I went to the conference uh, fairly underslept, and even at the best of times, I'm not somebody who handles sitting down for many hours at a time all that well. I, I need to walk around every so often. Standing desks help me a lot. Um, tea, uh, tea of course helps, but 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 yeah, even even when I find something really interesting, I, I need to have the ability to just get my uh, my blood flowing uh, every so often, just to, to stay awake. And being underslept did not help one bit. Um, the uh, the conference was held at a Marriott uh, uh, near the, uh, the Wall Street station. Um, it, it was a pretty nice uh, facility, and there were there was a lot of good food. Um, uh, yeah, just just a lot of good uh, topics, but I, I focused mostly on how do we make the scale bigger, uh, what are the clustering and um, and failover features, uh, stuff like that. Although there were some other tracks that I thought about going to that would have been neat. Um, I like the R statistical language, and um, somebody uh, somebody has written uh, so Postgres. You you can embed programming languages into it. Uh, meaning that you can write your stored procedures in Perl or Python, or uh, or R or or the Oracle uh, Oracle PL one. Uh, is it PL one? Uh, uh, or it's PL uh, SQL. Yeah, it's just programming language uh, SQL. You have uh, you you have a lot of options with Postgres. Uh, what language you want to write stored procedures in, which means that if you want to do a database heavy, uh, heavy work, you can actually potentially do it in the database, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I, I have a long list of things to look into now, which I'll probably be doing over the next week. Because um, for the last while, I haven't had particularly good um, skilled technical contacts. When I was at Carnegie Mellon, I mean, universities are great for that. When you're working for a university, there are, you, you choose your company. Universities tend to be big. And if you're in a computer science department, you'll know a lot of uh, really clued and, of course, not so clued people. And uh, if you want to stay abreast of current technologies, then it's not hard. It's a lot harder in a, in a startup. And uh, it's also been uh, pretty hard uh, even being outside of uh, outside of that um, for for many of the last uh, few years, so I haven't really had great local technical contacts outside of meetup groups, which aren't super frequent. Um, so I, I'm a little bit uh, I've fallen a little bit behind on knowing about things that I should know when it comes to developments in uh, in technologies. But but yeah, this this was very helpful, particularly uh, on the database side, uh, particularly and. One of the things that I really thought was interesting and which I didn't know about before is that uh, Postgres actually does pretty well at the types of loads that people, uh, at least recently, have been using NoSQL uh, databases for, um, key value stores, uh, um, array stores, stuff like that, which means uh, that I'll be able to advocate Postgres in those situations, um, honestly. Uh, and it means that the, the scope of, of necessary use for those is, uh, is narrower. I mean, I'm, I'm generally of the belief that if you have a data store and it needs to be database-ish, then unless you have a really good reason otherwise, you should be using a relational database uh, with, with SQL. Um, and, and there are good reasons at, at times not to do that. Uh, but uh, most of the time, most people don't actually have good reasons, even if they think they do. They don't understand SQL. They don't understand how to actually set up a decent database, or they're picking the wrong database, like MySQL. Um, 
And so it's good to, I have a cat here who's flying, I think. Um, it's, it's good to, uh, to know that I can comfortably use Postgres for that and recommend that others do too. And, and the, the reason to prefer that is both that you get ACID compliance. Um, ACID, it's a set of four traits that many uh, relational databases have that are, they're basically guarantees that you're going to want if you understand what they are. Um, atomicity, concurrency, independence, and durability. Um, and basically, if, if you structure your, your interactions with the data store in transactions in an ACID compliant database, then you get those four features. Um, it means your queries won't interfere with each other. They, uh, they will, per, uh, you'll know whether they persist or not. Uh, you'll, your, your database will be in a coherent state without a lot of additional logic to, to make sure that it is, and, uh, and so on. So there's that, and there's a lot of just in, uh, existing infrastructure for how to, um, for how to work with, uh, with those kinds of databases as well. You have the concept of a dump, uh, of a database dump, you have a, a relatively standard syntax. Um, you have really nice tools that will uh, interface with with your database. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of value in sticking with SQL uh, it, with some form of a SQL database if uh, if you can do it. And I'm not talking about uh, Microsoft SQL Server. I'm just in general talking about uh, SQL databases. Um, Microsoft SQL Server is fairly mediocre database. It's not bad. It's not amazing. It's actually code related in a kind of uh, elaborate sense to Postgres because it's derived from Ingress, um, which uh, Postgres is as well. Um, but in any case, yeah, it was a, a great conference. I'm glad I went. Although I, both yesterday and today, when I got home, I almost immediately uh, uh, needed to take a nice long nap to recover from the sleep that that uh, that I was suffering, um, am suffering. I'm, I'm still pretty tired, but yeah, just for some reason, uh, the last the two nights I've been going to bed around three or four, and given that I need to wake up around eight to make it to the, uh, or, or I need to wake up around eight to make it there uh, on time, four hours of sleep is definitely not enough um, for, uh, for a technical conference. Um, so that's the, the last, uh, that's the last week. Um, uh, recently I've been enjoying reading, or no, I've, I've started to, so there's this Russian uh, urban fantasy uh, series. Uh, um, like the, the first one in the series is called, uh, um, I have to, I'll get this, No Choi Dozor. Um, and I, I, in English, it's uh, Night Watch, and it has a uh, a sequel. Uh, it has a, a sequel film called um, uh, Dniev Dniev Noi uh, uh, Dozor, uh, which is Day Watch, and I enjoyed uh, just randomly watching both of those films on Netflix, and so I uh, got the books on on Kindle, and I'm starting to work my way through it. I am. Uh, I'm uh, reading them uh, in English because my, my Russian is not particularly impress uh, impressive, but the, they're a neat series. They, uh, they seem to, to have a, a fairly uh, worked out uh, mythology, uh, and I appreciate that, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I also read, uh, read a book called Rapture of the Nerds by, I think, Corey Doctrineau and... Um, Oh, it occurs well, maybe? Uh, the, the big names in science fiction. It, it, it's one of these um, transhumanist uh, sci-fi novels, and I, I thought it was uh, was pretty good. It, it reminded me a lot of the... Um, so uh, my, my favorite science fiction author is Ken McLeod. He does political science fiction. Um, he's a, a, a Scottish a socialist uh, author. Um, and he's, uh, he's, he's written a, a reasonable number of books, and uh, I've enjoyed the, the mixing of exploration of social and science fiction issues with uh, uh, well, social, social issues, cultural issues uh, in, in his sci-fi. 
and he happens to uh, in in a lot of his works he he name drops other works and uh, and I just was curious about the origin of the phrase and it turned out out to be uh, the uh, turned out to be uh, that uh, the name of this book Rapture of the Nerds so picked it up I uh, really enjoyed it I, I finished it earlier today. Um, Yeah, so uh, on the job fronts, as, as I, I think I mentioned, I'm still waiting to hear back about that opportunity uh, or that potential opportunity. Um, I'm doing uh, a little bit of contract work for, uh, for a friend, um, and it's, it's fun stuff. It's, it's a short, uh, it's a short uh, task where there's, uh, there's an existing server that uh, logs stuff into some really fancy and weird databases. Uh, it, it, it runs as a listener, and there are uh, clients that, uh, separate clients that you write the talk to it that submit data. And so I was asked by this friend to write a drop-in replacement for that server that would, uh, that would listen in a similar way, but just log things in a, uh, to, uh, to text files. Um, which it's not that hard, actually. The core logic is easy. It just basically took me a little bit of time to figure out the the line protocol between uh, the clients and servers, that so that I could faith, uh, faithfully re-implement it. Um, I, I've already done the work to. Uh, I have the line protocol documented, and it should just be a single hacking session to to put together a nice scalable uh, server that'll that'll act as a drop-in replacement, but. I don't know. It's it's little tasks like that that um, they they help. I don't know when I, when I'm programming. Sometimes I like working on big stuff. Sometimes I like working on small stuff. But with the big stuff, it's a lot easier to work on it once it kind of works initially. So you, you have this long stretch of coding that just isn't that enjoyable. Like designing software is fun, um, and and just tweaking it once it kind of works to make it work better. That's fun. Code refactoring, fun stuff, particularly once you have unit tests. But it's that kind of staggering out into the dark when it doesn't actually compile yet, when it doesn't do anything interesting yet. That's a little bit less uh, less fun, and any bigger project, you're probably going to be doing at least a little bit of that. Or you might not have integrated uh, bits of, uh, of the project together yet, and so you might only have your chunk of code passing uh, unit tests, uh, but but yeah, the, the smaller coding projects where you basically sit down, you write them, and they work. That's it's a lot less complicated, but it's uh, it's nice to have those just to keep your overall enthusiasm for programming uh, high. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward now that I fully understand the task. Probably this weekend I'll, I'll just sit down and uh, and uh, push that kind of thing out. Um, so I switched from from carrying a a regular giant laptop around uh, to carrying a Chromebook around, which uh, or a few months ago, which is good for my back because uh, the Chromebook. It's a 14-inch laptop, but that's a lot lighter than the laptops I normally carry around, particularly with all the accessories that I normally bring. But the downside is that there's not a lot of... Uh, you, you can't really install much in the way of software on the Chromebook, so it's not so good for experimenting with. Uh, say, it, it would have been nice at the conference today to have had my main laptop there and to have been able to have uh, played with uh, Postgres. But I mean, that top doesn't really have much in the way of battery life, and it's heavy. Um, so I might have to carry around the main laptop a little bit more for the next few days, though, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'll need to write that uh, that code thing for the friend. Um, I mean, it, it, it is a a paid uh, paid thing, but uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll need to write that, and I'm redoing my uh, my website to a certain extent, and it's nice to have. Uh, a local uh, Git repository. Um, I mean, I guess in theory I could do a lot of this stuff on my server, uh, since I do have uh, a, 
a server with a vanity domain and all of that, but it's not running a particularly current version of, of a Linux distro. And I prefer not to tweak it that much. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's the, the laptop, uh, my main laptop is getting kind of near the end of its useful life with having such a short battery uh, life and it's gotten a little bit flaky over the years. Um, so I'm a little bit reluctant to move it around, particularly given that right now uh, with my uh, home computing setup, I'm effectively using it as a desktop. Um, but I, I, I'm a little bit worried that just at some point it just won't power up because it's occasionally had issues with powering up before. Um, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm not really worried about losing data, but it's kind of useful to have it there as a functionality thing. And being between jobs right now means I couldn't quickly replace it if I wanted to. And that's a bit of a bummer. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm still following international politics. Uh, not a lot is is going on. Uh, or I mean, not a lot of truly new events are going on this week um, or, or, or uh, have happened over the last week. A little bit more of weird stuff from Argentina, saber rattling over the Falkland uh, Islands. Um, Russia continues to occupy uh, Crimea. Um, ineffective attempts at progress uh, on peace between, uh, or I mean, at, at US negotiated peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and so on. Uh, there was a yeah, there, there was um, a, an event in tech that I'm not very happy about. Uh, uh, Brandon Knight was, uh, he became the, uh, the CEO of, of Mozilla briefly, but he was forced to resign after a bunch of uh, nutty gender activists raised a big stink about his personal politics. Um, I mean, I, these are well-meaning activists. And uh, the, the problem is that I, uh, he, donated money to push against uh, uh, against gay marriage in California, which, I mean, I, I, I believe gays should be able to marry uh, just as much as straight people should. So I, I disagree with Ike on that issue, but I do see it as a matter of personal, uh, personal politics, and I don't think it's a good trend to have, I don't think it's a, it's a good trend to have uh, efforts to get people fired from their job based on their personal politics. That's, that wouldn't be a good road for us to go down as a society. I mean, maybe I might be willing to see certain types of politics, like stuff that's way, way out there. Maybe there you, you might be willing to, uh, to see that kind of activism, like the, the crazy stuff that you see uh, in many African uh, nations right now, where they're locking up gay people. Anybody advocating that? Sure, try and get them fired. Uh, I, I I don't care about that, but it, the that's a civil rights issue, and I don't think marriage is a civil rights issue, or or if it is, it's a very minor one. I see marriage as being more about path paving, like what's considered normal in society, what you're going to give a little bit of additional support on to make it uh, to make it a little bit easier to uh, to, to avoid some kinds of paperwork. What niceties are we going to provide? Legal recognition of marriage isn't necessary to live reasonably in a, uh, in a society. It's nice, something I support. It's not necessary, it's path paving. And I don't think it's generally a great idea to make a huge fuss over uh, path paving issues, or at least not to the level of shunning people, trying to get them fired, things like that. Where, I mean, compare that to uh, the, the, the backwards uh, nations in Africa that, uh, or, or in Russia that are locking people up for, for, for being in non-straight relationships. That's, that's not path paving because if you're locked up just for, for being in a non-straight relationship, you're, you're locked up. That's basically you can't contribute to society. You can't reasonably live in society if you're stuck in jail. 
um, recognition is different. It's not it's not something uh, worth fighting at that level over. And so I, I think it's not a not a healthy thing that he was uh, shoved out of uh, Mozilla that way. Uh, well, shoved out of the, the leadership of Mozilla that way. Um, but oh well, uh, I, I all, all I could do is criticize and hope people listen. Um, So tomorrow I'm going on a walking tour that's held by the Transit Museum, uh, and the walking tour is we're going along set, uh, the uh, the Seven Line and seeing its uh, current uh, or parts of its current and future uh, uh, future route, uh, which should be neat. I don't think we're going to get to see the new the new station uh, that's uh, that's located on the uh, on the far west side. Of, uh, of Manhattan, but we might, and it would be really cool if we could. Uh, but I don't think that's included in this tour. Um, but still, uh, the Transit Museum, I, I, I do generally like, or well, no, I, I do like their tours, and it, uh, it's, it's kind of a neat community because, as, as I've mentioned before, if you live in New York, you're kind of, you're gonna get fond of the subway system, and. Uh, it's just neat to see such a large uh, system moving so many people around all the time. And uh, it, it kind of, I think the subway, it's, it's almost, it's a symbol of the city. It's a symbol of civilization. And it's a very, I, I guess, I'm, I'm using this term metaphorically here. It's a very democratic element to, uh, to, to society in that a lot of, uh, of the class divisions you rub shoulders with all kinds of people in the subway. They're, they're very rich people in their, in their suits to a certain extent, although many of them just take taxis everywhere. Um, the crazy, nutty hobos and uh, and the um, Jesus freaks and, um, and and all that. You'll, you'll see all kinds in the subway. And it's, it's kind of nice. It's also really, really convenient being able to get anywhere in, in the city or at least many places in the city without needing to uh, to worry if you're on a bus, like how close am I to where I need to get to go? Uh, worrying if you're in a car, oh my goodness, I, I have to worry about traffic and all, uh, and all that. And, and or, or walking, which is, is kind of, like a lot of people, you get on the subway, you zone out and you occasionally glance up and look at the display to see how close you are or listen for announcements. And that's nice. It's a really nice way to, to get around in, in a really big city. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, my, I'm, I'm making uh, good progress in my Let's Play series uh, in Fallout 3. Uh, I'm not sure how, uh, I've done one of the, uh, one of the DLCs there are two others. I'm not sure if I'm going to do both of them. There's also uh, I'm I'm taking it slow, wandering around the game, since I, I guess there's a demographic with uh, with uh, let's plays of people uh, who who are are probably never going to play the actual game, and uh, and those people, it's just neat to let them see what the game is like, and of course there are people who see the uh, who see a let's play and they they decide whether to, to play the game based on that, but. Fallout 3, it is an older game, uh, and I mean, it's, it's a fun game, but it's an older game. Fallout 4, I imagine, will probably be coming out uh, maybe within a year or two, and after that point, uh, I mean, the, the graphics are actually good enough, they scale up well enough that you, you're, you're not really going to feel like you're suffering uh, much from bad graphics, but the textures, they're not as high res as you would like, but... Still, uh, uh, newer games, they're more complicated and often more fun. Um, and so I expect, uh, I mean, from this point onward, I'm not sure how many people are going to go back and play Fallout 3, particularly once Fallout 4 is announced and comes out. But you never know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm taking my time playing through it uh, uh, with, with the uh, series. And... And I hope people are enjoying it. 
Uh, I obviously need to uh, need to convince myself that my current attempts at recording my my classes. I, I need to produce ones that I feel are good enough to actually put onto YouTube because I've done a lot of. I'll work through it for about an hour. I'll go back and look at it, and it's not quite polished enough, or I didn't. Uh, there are bits where I'm not satisfied with uh, with how I presented them, and so I, I just make notes and edit my materials to do it differently next time. But I might be being a little bit uh, excessively uh, perfectionist, and I'm not even sure whether my aesthetics here are are improving the product or not. But I guess there's that temptation to just keep tinkering rather than uh, publish. But such as life. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that's that's been this uh, uh, this episode of of the blog, and I'll see you in the next one.